All right. Excellent. Bill and banter here, right? Yeah, this is the point at which banter starts as we <laughs> welcome everybody who's piling in. Um, we're gonna we're gonna give people a second to get in. If you want to introduce yourself in the chat, you can say where you where you're currently calling in from. If you want to share your company, you can. If you want to share whether you are um, an operations uh, side of the the business, quality engineering. Um, if you're interested in a particular topic, feel free to put that directly in the chat. You may have to change your chat so that it says to all participants versus just host and panelists so that everybody else can see it. And we'll get started here in a minute. You, Gary, you did that. You have to do it to everyone. Ah, interesting. Okay. <laughs> Host and panelists. Here yes, we go. Yes, got it. Introduce and by the way, I will chat if you're just joining us so people know who's on. Um, we're going to have a great conversation today. Really excited about it. Yeah, and, and I think Joel, Joel's managing the uh, chat. Is that right? Yep, yep. Okay, yep. Joel, if, if anything pops up, um, just bring it to my attention because I probably won't be looking at that most of the time. <laughs> All right, and uh, hi, Russ, welcome. Oh, Kevin. Yeah. Is that the Kevin we all we all know and love from Apple days? <laughs> awesome. I think it is. iPad Kevin. <laughs> nice. And somewhere hi, I haven't Frank. seen or heard from him in a long you again. time. All righty. Hi, Santi. Good to see you again as well. A lot of different kinds of products represented here just in our attendees today. Awesome. Well, we're going we're gonna to kick off and some people may continue to join us. Um, welcome to Change Notice. This is where industry leaders discuss consumer electronics, supply chain, and manufacturing optimization. And my name is Anna Shedletsky. I'm CEO and one of the founders of Instrumental. Uh, and I'm really excited to be joined today by Garrett Bastable. And so I'm actually going to let him introduce himself. Um, I, I, Garrett and I first knew each other from our Apple days. Um, so Garrett, tell us a little bit about who you are, um, what you've been up to, and the first thing you took apart. Yeah, hi, Anna. Um, really appreciate the invitation to uh, join uh, you and, and Joel and the instrumental team um, and just talk to you a little bit about what, what we've been up to and, and, and some manufacturing topics as well. Um, so in terms of my background, so I, I work at a company called Density. I helped start Density and join the founding team about six years ago uh, prior to Density. Um, I was at Apple for eight years uh, in operations as well. So at Density, I lead operations. And at Apple, I was in the operations group. In my first five years, I led a strategic sourcing team managing uh, $1.8 billion in annual spend. My team was responsible for all the connectors and cables uh, that went into every product at Apple. And then the last three years while I was there, uh, I helped uh, lead a, a portion of the original Apple Watch team focusing on the, uh, the S1 uh, SIP module, the system and package that serves as the brains for the Apple Watch. And that's how Anna and I first met uh, is on that original Apple Watch team. Um, and then prior to Apple, so earlier in my career, I was in the uh, United States Navy as an operations officer. And um, one of the things I did was uh, led a boarding team off the coast of Somalia doing anti-piracy operations, which is a lot different than building hardware, but, um, but nonetheless, a, a good experience, a good early career experience. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm uh, grateful to be here today to, to chat about what, we, what we're up to. Uh, Anna, do you want me to just roll right into, you asked me about what I first took apart. Do you want me to talk yeah, right about that? Yeah, or? what did you first okay. take apart? Yeah, so this was a memorable one for me. Um, back in the mid 90s, my family got, uh, probably like many families got a Dell, um, like a Dell tower. And 
Uh, I forget what happened, but it, it wasn't working. So I decided to take it apart and um, turned out as a hard drive. And it was a, uh, I distinctly remember this it was an IBM 2.6 gigabyte hard drive that had failed. And what's funny to me is that you can't even get a thumb drive today that's that small. And, and that's maybe a couple minutes of 4K video, but that was the entire hard drive. I ultimately took apart the, both the computer and the hard drive. And then fast forward, probably more than 15 years, almost 20 years, I end up at Apple and my first job at Apple was in mass storage procurement, uh, sourcing hard drives for all the Macs. So <laughs> I, I started with my very first teardown being a hard drive and, and then ended up um, buying a lot of hard drives in my career, so. I think uh, as Steve Jobs says, the dots connect looking backwards. So it looks, that sounds there like you go. had some connected dots. What are you up to now for at sure. Density? Yeah, so um, at Density, we're creating the ability uh, to measure how people use space anywhere in the world. And when we understand how people or how humans use spaces, we, we believe we can lower emissions and create less waste and uh, build more accessible and equitable spaces for everyone. And that, that's a somewhat grandiose statement, but um, there's a lot behind that. Uh, it originally started at Density just wanting to understand how busy our favorite coffee shop was. And today, we work with um, many of the Fortune 500 companies and major universities to help them understand how, how their space is used. And um, obviously, I think somewhat obviously, at least to us, is with pandemic, uh, the need to understand capacity and um, utilization of spaces for safety reasons also has been, has been a really big deal. And as people return to work in the hybrid work environment, um, understanding how uh, spaces are used, what, uh, what the density ironically of a space is and um and so that's where we where we've seen a ton of our growth and scale is uh you know major major customers of ours um trying to understand how to return to the office safely and uh in a new basically in a new way of working um so <clears throat> i don't know if anna just to give people a sense of this would it be helpful if i quickly just shared something we re uh, recently released called heat maps yeah. Would that be? Do that for, okay. For let, me, let me see if I can't share my screen real quick. You're going to have to be descriptive because we will have, we will have users that are, uh, that are just listening. Yep. Audio. Nope. So what are we looking at here? No problem. Yeah. So literally days ago, we released a new, a new tool. Um, and this is kind of what I described as how density helps people understand how you, uh, space is used. So this happens to be our office in San Francisco. And this is, uh, we, we don't use thermal, and I'll get into this later. We don't use thermal. We use an anonymous uh, technology, either uh, infrared time of flight or um, a radar technology to achieve this. But essentially what you can see here is over time, uh, how long people have been in uh, parts of a space, how long they've lingered there, the longer they've lingered there, uh, the brighter the object. And this, um, you know, for, for if you're in uh, workplace planning or, or employee experience, or if you're at a university trying to understand how students use the cafeteria or the library or the computer lab, I mean, just knowing where humans are and how long they're there is, is, is gold to these groups. Um, so yeah, and this is something we just came out with and, and we're pretty excited about and our customers are also excited about. Obviously, you know, there's technology that underlies this and we'll talk about that here in a bit, but um, any any questions? Uh, again, I'm not monitoring the chat, but Anna, perhaps you could help me if there are any questions about this. No, I think we're good. Why don't we Why don't we um, dig into kind of the meat and potatoes of our chat today, which I think is you sure. know, why folks are are really interested. Um, one of the most interesting things about density, I think, from the outside looking in, I'm sure there's many interesting things from the inside looking out, um, is that you ultimately decided to build your own factory. Um, and to do so in your backyard in upstate New York, um, that's right. a little contrarian uh, for electronics manufacturing. Um, you know, even at like low to medium sized volumes, it's still a little contrarian, particularly for harbor startups. So tell us how you made that decision, like the first, the first decision to actually build in your backyard. Yeah, yeah, you're you're right. I guess we, to a degree, would like to think it's contrarian, but don't want you know it's not a, something we're keeping a secret on because we we you know what we've learned we've shared with other people. Um, so yeah, the quick the quick point is um, ultimately we did build our own production facility from the ground up in Syracuse, New York. Um, and you know I know there's folks that maybe only listen to the audio, but for those with the video, 
Um, if I, I have a one minute clip of that, I'm going to show just because I think, I think, uh, you know, if a picture says a thousand words, I don't know what a video says a million words, but um, I, I, I think the video is somewhat helpful. Now, mind you, this video is years old. So we've come a long way since this video. Um, and uh, I know you won't be able to hear the audio. It's just kind of a, a music track in the background, but let me go full screen here. Okay. Can you see that, Anna? Yeah, it's working. What are we looking yeah, at? Yeah, so this was our, yep, this was our very first uh, in-house production line. Um, again, this is years ago. We've come a very long way since then, but all the folks you see in this video are on, uh, are either on my team or in our company. And, um, and basically it was our first kind of proof of concept of being able to do to do what we do today at scale, but to do it domestically, you know, like you said, right in our own backyard. Um, so, you know, we need to get a more current version of this because I, I think it's come quite a way, as I mentioned, but yeah, this is what we're, this is what we're up to in, uh, in Syracuse. And, and in my experience, if I saw this video, I would have said this was in Asia somewhere. Um, and instead it's, it's, it's right here in the United States. So you do, you do box build, like final assembly, testing, packing, and what um, component, do you do any component assembly or you have vendors doing component assembly upstream and you're just doing final assembly? What is kind of the breakdown between what happens in this, in your own facility um, versus what, what you leverage vendors for? Yeah, so um, I caught some of that. The audio was was overlapping a bit, but essentially, or the music in the background. But essentially, um, yes, it's we we do FATP, so final assembly test and pack out. We also um, uh, we also do what, what what has become somewhat proprietary in terms of our calibration process. Some of our secret sauce, and so here again, um, while there's, I'll go into one of the, some of the benefits of building domestically, but those include IP protection. You know, if our, if our own full-time employees are doing the work, um, we don't have to risk sending our algorithm over to Asia. Um, we don't have to risk uh, sharing our, our know-how um, because, you know, uh, having spent a lot of time in Asia, I know Anna did as well. We used to, gosh, I think I spent close to hundred days a year in China at times. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's common over there to, you know, to a degree copy, I think it's a form of flattery to copy what, what, what others are doing. Um, and, you know, that for us would be a risk. So I think we, uh, we see it as a benefit to be domestic, especially on some, on some aspects that pack out and other things that aren't proprietary, no big deal. But, but I, again, that calibration piece. So we, FATP plus, um, plus photonics work and other things are domestic. And then the piece that we, we did, we do still leverage in Asia just because the expertise there is so strong is some of our complex module SMT, we did try to build to do that domestically and had, had run into challenges. Um, we, we still hope to do that domestically at some point, but it turned out um, the, the best locations for that were in Asia. And so, like, I think this is a little bit, I, I was, and continue to be curious around, um, and I'm sure others are as well, uh, you know, like, I think people get scared away, particularly if they're building a new product from building it in the US, um, because they think it's too expensive. Um, that's, I think, probably the general fear. Right. Um, and so let's talk about some of the benefits and drawbacks um, and like as, you know, tactical kind of get into the tactical. So maybe mm -hmm. let's start with the benefits of like building your own factory. Cause it seems like a dream come true for someone who, yep. you know, you don't have to travel yep. to China. You're like right there, you can spill out onto the line and, and, and solve problems, uh, firsthand. So what are some of the amazing mm -hmm. benefits of having the factory in your backyard? Yep. Um, I, so I would love to I would love to answer that, but I think what might be helpful if if it's okay is a bit of a brief history and some lessons learned to how we got here. And in that, I think I think the cost and the quality discussion and the benefits will become more apparent. Do you mind if I go through that first? Yeah, let's do it. Okay. And I do see some chat questions coming in. I um I think that Joel and maybe Anna will look at those and we can we can plug those in either at the end or or throughout. Yeah. Um, okay, so in terms of in terms of um how we how this came to be. Um, six plus years ago, we're a small, a very small team. And what we actually sell, as you saw with the heat maps is, is a SaaS solution. So we originally planned to do, actually what I should, should say we hoped to do was to buy existing people counting hardware and white label it. 
uh, and then and then focus our energies on our software product. Um, but what happened was, uh, and we quickly realized uh, that nothing existed uh, that met our requirements. One of the key requirements is anonymity. So our product is anonymous um, at the source. And that was very important for us. We don't want to know your age, gender, ethnicity, anything. We just want to know if it's a human versus a shopping cart versus a dog, you know, coming into a space or, or exiting a space. So at the time, um, you know, in an effort to accelerate our, our time to market and with a thin budget, like all small companies, all startups naturally face, what we first did was attempted to partner with not just one, but three different hardware uh, design and engineering firms. And I, I'm smiling because I'm sharing some deep pain we have from having attempted these things. So just know I'm, we've made a number of mistakes. Um, I think though, understanding the mistakes allows us to understand the successes. So, you know, we tried to partner with three different hardware design and engineering firms. And, you know, painfully these um, the efforts just didn't work out and they didn't yield the required results. And what we found was that it turns out building a, an, an anonymous uh, people counting technology like we have is a lot harder than it might sound at first. So um, around that uh, uh, same time, we were pursuing a traditional contract manufacturing partnership. So um, as I mentioned earlier, you know, Anna and I have spent uh, many, 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 many days in China, more than we probably want to admit. And But as a result, we've, we've uh, you know, bumped into, gotten to know a number of contract manufacturers. So the, we put out an RFQ process to the likes of Foxconn and Quanta and Pegatron and Jable and Fabernet and Benchmark and Flextronics. And many of these groups are obviously world-renowned groups, but the general consensus from these groups, and I, I don't know who's in the call and I don't know the stage of your companies per se, but I would say that um, their consensus was uh, if the volume is high enough, We'd love to build it for you. And oh, by the way, you just need to tell us how. And, and so uh, the two challenges we, we faced, um, struggling to achieve our product design goals with a third party and struggling to find a CM that was willing and able to build what we wanted initially at lower volume and initially um, uh, initially where, where we would provide them the, 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 the knowledge uh, instead of expecting it from them. Um, those, those two things for us turned out to be catalyzing events that ultimately landed us where we are. So this caused us to shift our strategy and we decided in-house um, all of our, our, our uh, hardware engineering and operations and design work. And that turned out to be a breakthrough decision for us. Um, so, you know, our original models, as I, again, I can't speak for everyone else, but I'll tell you what I expected. I expected to be faster to work with a third party and to be cheaper to work with a CM. And it turned out that ultimately um, in-housing electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, embedded systems and firmware, systems design, uh, systems engineering, industrial design, data science and algorithm, photonics, the whole works, plus um, uh, you know, ultimately building our own factory turned out to be uh, without a doubt the right decision for us. Um, on our way to doing that, it was still not a totally clean path. And we didn't go from, okay, we're not going to work with Foxconn to we're going to build this in Syracuse. We actually ended up partnering with a, with a great CM out of Plano, Texas. Um, and it was a wonderful group of people. Uh, and they had built this technology before. So, you know, we, we, we leaned on them originally. But again, we learned a lesson here, which is that we actually had all the capabilities in-house ourselves. All we really needed was a facility and, and operators. And so here we are, we built our own factory. Now, um, talking about cost first, I guess one question I'd have, and I don't know, Anna, if you want to guess or if others want to chime in, but can anyone guess what our first production line uh, cost us to build? Well, that's a good one. Put some answers in the chat. How, how um, can you share some, some capabilities of this line? Like how many, how many stations does it have or how long yeah. is it or... Yeah, that's a good question. So, you know, the space was call it uh, 5,000 square feet plus or minus. And we had, um, you know, we had one full production line. We have a, we have a, uh, and it's somewhat, again, unique to our product, but we had that complex calibration station. So we do a power, uh, a power check because we use class one I safe lasers and we're, we're an FDA self-certifying authority. So we need to be able to be sure that our lasers uh, meet the FDA requirements to be class one and I safe. So we have that station and we have another calibration station. And then, but not you, you know, automated we got assembly a, or other automation. 
Some automation, yes. So we do have servo motors um, turning turning our, our device because we have to look through different lenses in a photonics train. So that we, we built all that. Our team is incredible. Um, we have some amazing engineers. Um, uh, uh, a, a person named Lukash Zahaya from uh, Cornell, Masters Mackey, which I know, Anna, you have a Masters in Mackey. You'll appreciate he, he came in and did a lot of the photonics work. Um, we had a number of other people. Um, uh, a person named Victoria, she helped us design a lot of our test processes, again, on, on stuff that, that you know, she has a PhD, so that, that's helpful in this type of scenario. Uh, you know, with these types of folks on the problem, we were able to build all this ourselves. And then, yes, we had the rest of a normal line, like a compute station, burn-in, okay. and so forth. So, so, so yeah, I don't know like if anyone has any... Between one and five million... <laughs> Although someone is suggesting contrarian 45K. I, so, so who, that, who got that, close? <laughs> the contrarian is very close. Uh, our first line cost about $60,000, which is blew my mind. I would have without, I don't know who said 1.25. That was very close to my estimate. And when you actually go out and you end up buying all the equipment yourself, I mean, there were parts that were expensive, you know, $5,000 camera or something for this specialized test, but the benches and all that are actually really reasonable. Um, and we're able to build thousands of units on this on this single production line. We already have, you know. And when you look at the cost of, and so the comparison that that I was doing in the modeling that proved out to be better than expected was, if you were to fly just flying people and putting them for months in Asia, um, you know, engineers and the cost of hotels and travel. You I mean that alone? Not to mention the 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 MVA, the the manufacturer's value add cost. That alone would easily wipe away the, um, would wipe away the cost of that initial line. Someone was asking, um, what was the UPH, UPH and volume? volume? Yeah, so we do have our UPH calcs. I, I, I'd rather just talk in terms of volume. That line allowed us to build, that just that one line allowed us to build in excess of 10,000 a year. Now we've multiplied that line since. Um, so we're, you know, we're easily able to get to the 50K mark. And I'm yet, not yet talking about our new facility because we have a new facility and I'll talk about that, but uh, essentially, yeah, that single line, um, you know, with a very small number of people and, and uh, a very small investment in the, I should also say someone else. Okay. Thanks, Frank. Um, <laughs> Frank was just saying it was a good story. Uh, well, the, the other thing I think Anna to note is, so the cost of the line is one piece. People say, okay, what about the facility? What about the cost of the space? We partnered with a group in upstate New York that helped kind of, um, in a way, you know, subsidize some of this. Uh, this group's called Center State. They're a corporation for economic opportunity in upstate New York. And they helped us, um, you know, get this facility in inside of a larger uh, building called the Technology Garden. And that really got us going. Um, however, uh, we've outgrown it, to be honest. We're still going to lean on that, I'm sure. But what we're doing now is doubling down on our model. And, and I'm excited to share that just in the last week or two, we've signed uh, for a lease, a, a multi-year lease for a facility that's quadruple the size of our, what I showed you in that video, quadruple the size of that and around seven times the total capacity. So we're looking in now almost approaching half a million units per year of, of capacity in this new facility. Um, Let's yeah. talk about quality. So like, let's get to brass tacks yeah. of like, okay, so it sounds like it wasn't as expensive as you thought. So this whole thing about like building in the US, like maybe, maybe not as expensive as people thought. Talk about quality, because I know you had a great story just around like how quality is different coming out of your own facility when you, when your operators and factory folks are density employees with density badges, like tell us about mm -hmm. that. Yeah, I mean, so so one of the side benefits of to in housing everything is that we frankly have insanely good quality. It's it's unbelievable to me. I mean, Anna, you and I worked on things like iPhone and iPod, and these we we knew what what good quality metrics were from arguably the best in the world, and and frankly, you know, our our results are just still blowing my mind. I, I almost like I said, they're almost unbelievable to me. But we do very um, thorough reporting and analysis. And to give you one example, on a single product line, um, we've shipped thousands of these. They're, they're, these are not just shipped; these are online in the field. In many cases, for you know years, out of that line, we only have two confirmed field failures ever. Now, 
We do get other people that have an issue with the software or they can't connect to their network or something, but I'm talking actual failed product, two, two devices out of thousands, okay? And, and um, I, I feel like this is an ideal time to kind of plug instrumental a little bit, which you did not ask me to do, but I'll tell you that what we've learned is that we have to get, achieve these results. We have to be fanatical about our metrics and we track every opportunity for improvement. So we, be, again, because the workers are, are full-time employees on my team, these are not, you know, a third party. We, they get the same, uh, um, you know, they, by law, they have to be hourly, but we get, we give them the same benefits as everyone else in the company has. So they have the plat, literally the platinum healthcare plan. They have these other things. And so we're, we're one of the most attractive places to work. And as a result, um, these people care so deeply about the product. It's not halfway across the world where someone's building your product amongst a hundred others. This, this group is building just for density. And so they are very conscious of, the, of, of every device that gets built and the quality. And if we ever catch a problem, we immediately in near real time can implement a fix for that. And that is just minimized to an incredible extent our escapes. I mean, early on in, in a very first product line, of course, we had some escapes. Even then, it was still, you know, 1% or less failure rate. Um, today, we're talking uh, tenths of 100, t yeah, tenths of 100% of, of, of failure rate, right? Uh, tenths of a percent, I should say, or even less, hundreds basis of a percent point. of failure rate, which is Down in basis, basis points. points. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> basis points. Or what you were saying, DPPM. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah. I, the quality I, I don't, is I don't amazing. Know if that, the quality is amazing. Quality is amazing. Um, some, yep. One of our attendees who I think is like in the automation space is asking about how much was uh, automation was required to offset operations, operator costs, mm -hmm. uh, human costs, mm -hmm. which I, yep. I think like, as you know, coming out of the, like at least the op side of Apple, like it always seemed to me, no offense, I'm from the design side. So like we kind of both sides of the coin, it always seemed like you guys over there were always about cutting headcount. Um, and mm -hmm. automation. And so I'm kind of interested in, I think Zach's question is a great one just around like, was automation required to hit like these, like to make the cost competitive or is the cost competitive because the quality is so high that like, that's where the savings comes from. Yeah, a gr great question. So the, the, the um, I, I think the, the, qu the quick answer is that we did not Early on, we did not automate anything. And, and actually, I think we can look to like Tesla's example where they tried to automate everything and had a major blow up on that, kind of uh, pulled back on automation. We didn't even really initially try to automate. We knew we had the opportunity. Our focus was making sure the product worked and doing that. So the, the automation we did was um, very um, uh, surgical, meaning we didn't just say, let's automate everything. We looked at the items that were the longest time, most human involvement. And that happened to be, as I mentioned, the, the um, unique test for us on, on the one product I'm talking about is our power check test and our range, a range calibration test, uh, where we have to use like a checkerboard and, 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 and see how the, um, makes the lenses focused in the device. So even though our device, um, is totally anonymous, we collect depth data and depth data requires on the one device requires a lens and another device, we use a radar technology. So we do have an anechoic chamber and we do run um, RF testing in that. So we've automated, again, in, in surgical ways that made a big difference. And those, like in one example, when we were building in Plano, Texas, one of our steps took something crazy, like 43 minutes. Now this was just, this wasn't operator time. It was maybe five minutes of operator time, but it's 43 minutes. And by automating that step and adding the servo motors and doing some of that work that, um, that I mentioned, Luca, uh, Lukash and uh, Victoria had done and others, uh, we, we had numerous other engineers on our team. Uh, John Shanley was involved. These folks took, took this and, 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 and collapsed it down to I think three point something minutes. So we went from like 43 minutes. So, so yes, we automated, but it was not that expensive. I mean, I think the whole entire automation station that we did was like 15K or something. I mean, it's nothing crazy. It. Um, I, so, did, I did, did want to, oh, go oh I was just going to keep us moving because we were like, I want to make sure. sure we get through some of the other sure. questions that we have. Um, so, okay, we talked about amazing benefits. It feels a little bit like it feels great. What are the drawbacks? Interesting drawbacks to share that people should keep in mind about like biting this off. This seems like a big thing to bite off and, and try to chew on. Right. So um, I, th I thought about this obviously quite a bit uh, and, and I'm not, um, 
I'm not gonna suggest we've thought of everything, but I will tell you they're not actually that many. Um, you know, I think I think the reality is at some volume point, it probably doesn't make sense to build everything domestically. You know, in terms of strategy, at least my intent is we keep some portion of our work domestic always. And there's reasons for that. I mean, one of being we we sell to the federal government. And so being made in the USA is a, is a pretty big benefit there. Um, also, you know, being able to do R&D and, and um, uh, iterate so real time is very helpful. Um, you know, my guess you know, generically, if you're talking about, you know, any company out there, my guess is that somewhere around the 50k or less mark, in my view, it's probably a no brainer to build domestically. And I could go into why that is. And then somewhere over the 100k mark, of which frankly, we're going to be well into that territory next year. And we're not we're not stopping. Like I said, we just read, re, you know, doubled down and got a new, uh, a new facility. I think somewhere over the 100k mark, it just becomes a question of how, um, how much margin matters to you. For us, we sell a recurring uh, software license and we end up selling our hardware at a loss in many cases, either at a loss or break even. Um, and frankly, we hope someday to give our hardware away for free. So, you know, we're not a bomb plus margin uh, uh, model, right? We're, we're a model that's, that's looking to um, bring the cost of the hardware down so we can ultimately, ultimately give it away for free and focus on the data that's generated. Um, so, so the down in terms of downsides, uh, I think one of my biggest concerns, ironically, because we talked about quality, is we have set such a high bar for quality. As we scale, um, as we scale to these, you know, hundred low hundreds of thousands and you know mid hundreds of thousands range, I think every every manufacturer, every um, every company fears quality, uh, you know, might might take a dip, and so we're just working really hard to maintain that as we as we race to scale. Um, but, you know, like I said, I, I, I don't see a ton of difference. When we did the apples on the cost piece, that's what I just wanted to mention previously. We did an apples to apples with Asia. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know what others experience, but for the manufacturer value add cost, we would see was somewhere between 10 and 25% of your, of your bomb and your cost to build. We have gotten it down to around 8 to 10% of our hardware cogs. So we're at parity with the lower end of the MVA. However, if we're building millions, my, my statement may change. We just, I don't know where this is going to break and, you know, we're going to keep doing it this way until, until we have a concern, you know? Yeah. And maybe as a last question to wrap up our reported portion, uh, what do you, what advice do you have for companies considering following in density's footsteps, considering thinking about building in the U S um, and taking that contrarian view sounds like you make it sound pretty easy and kind of like a no brainer win. So what advice do you have so that, that people are well equipped to handle the challenges that you undertook to get to this state? Yeah, I mean, the quick advice is if you have a um, relatively simple product at high volume, this, this may not be a good strategy for you. Asia probably is right for you. Um, although I would, I, would, uh, I would advise you to you know, just remember that early on many teams think they have a simple product, which we did, and think they will hit high volume out the gate, we did. And, and reality is um, products are more complex than we perceive and the volume takes longer to get to. Uh, so if you wanted to follow in our footsteps and I should be clear this, you know, I'm an advisor to a couple of companies who've done just this with good success. So this model is a repeatable model. Um, then the major commitments I think you need to make, the advice I would give is hire excellent operations, engineering and design team members. It's critical, you cannot do this without those folks. Um, identify a viable uh, facility, uh, ideally one where you can get tax advantages or other things. Um, staff a high quality manufacturing team. So again, our assembly technicians, our, ma our ma uh, manufacturing managers are full-time employees of our company and get all the benefits and just invest in them because they will invest in your product. And then, and then the final piece, and again, I know you, you didn't definitely did not ask me to say this, but I think metrics are so important and, and you, you could really screw this up if you, if you don't track metrics and in Asia, there, there's more of a propensity to do that from experience. So we decided to overinvest in metrics. And I think, you know, instrumental and um, other metrics measuring tools are, are, are super valuable as you think about a shop floor control system and a quality control system and inventory management system and how all these will play together and, um, and, and how you can track this and, and maintain quality uh, and keep costs in check as you, as you scale. Yeah, so you're not flying blind here. This is a fully like instrumented factory. You've got you've got software, yep. you've got dashboards, 
You don't have to ask we a do. factory for the for the daily build report. You can just go look at it yourself. You can build out custom right. dashboards that you need, alerts, alarms, all of that valuable stuff. So awesome. Yep. Um, so we uh, change notice has two parts. This first part is the recorded part. There's a live uh, Q and A and discussion that's off the record after this. Um, so stay on while I just wrap us up for a second here, and you'll be able to ask Garrett your questions and an unfil and get unfiltered answers. Um, so. Join us on November 4th for our next change notice, which is our unsnapped variety. We're actually going to have a blue microphone engineer who will tear down a blue microphone and share insights about the design decisions that that team made um, in that product. Uh, and you can sign up for that on instrumental.com slash change dash notice. Um, so check it out. It's going to be great. And uh, that concludes our recorded session. Manufacturing is changing, and keeping programs agile and on schedule is harder than ever. Leading engineering teams rely on Instrumental to find issues earlier, fix them faster, and make sure they don't come back. Experience the first manufacturing optimization platform designed to enable continuous improvement of your process, from development through production, by unifying your data so your teams can make decisions faster. Instrumental makes finding correlations in product data easy, so your engineers can spend less time wrangling data across email, spreadsheets, and internal systems, and more time solving problems. It's simple. We put the right data in front of the right people in real time. Instrumental aggregates images of every unit at key assembly stages, parametric test data, and measurements in real time in a secure, managed cloud when installed across factories in a supply chain, brands and suppliers are able to work together to solve their most complex issues. From your first build, Instrumental's Discover AI proactively identifies new issues by scanning your products for anomalies and automatically delivering a daily queue of issues. Engineers can jumpstart failure analysis with defects in context. Engineers leverage a rich, remote data set to quickly identify correlations and potential root causes, and can push live tests to validate solutions immediately. They use Instrumental to eliminate issues at the source and make sure they don't come back. With complete build and issue analytics for the entire team, program leads can kickstart daily standups, streamline executive reporting, and communicate seamlessly with global teams. Instrumental has helped leading engineering and operations teams move faster, improve yield, and build better products from proto through production. Better products start with better data. Better products start with Instrumental. Schedule a demo today.